Welcome to r slash Tales from Tech Support, where we get to have a little chuckle at the technologically disadvantaged, like me. I'm Uncle Reddit, and have I got a story for you. Well, hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm going to say sorry ahead of time for any glitches that might happen during this recording. I'm doing a little experimenting with different, uh, different recording software, audio and visual, and uh, this is a whole new program, so hopefully the color correction looks a little better. Maybe I look a little clearer. Not that you give a crap about me because there's a cat down there. Why would you? Nah. Just let me know what you think. Opinions always welcome. Nice opinions are always welcome. Or respectful opinions. All right. Let's read some stories. Fine. You choose. Once upon a time, there were legendary beings called TV repairmen. These majestic creatures were often seen coming to the rescue when the big box in your house stopped showing moving pictures, making sounds, or any combination of those things. Yours truly was a member of this once proud tribe, now made all but extinct by cheap throwaway televisions and overly hard to service large screen sets. Even back then it was often a battle for the TV guy to be considered anything but a crook. People didn't like it when the magic box stopped working, but they really didn't like having to pay someone to fix it. Anyone who's worked in this field for long has a long list of crazy customer stories, and I'll be happy to share a few if there is interest, but I will share this one today for my own satisfaction. It's important to understand that there are a myriad of things that can go wrong with a TV set. The sound can be off, distorted, or just sound funny. Funny how? I mean funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you? The picture likewise can be distorted. The colors can be out of adjustment. The signal can be weak or the set may just be dead. The dead ones were by far the easiest to fix. You had a concrete problem. The biggest headaches came in when the problem wasn't quite so obvious. Every TV guy knew the complaint, and it made our hearts drop in our chests to hear it. It just doesn't look right. Or maybe, the color just isn't right. These descriptions can be very obvious, like when the weatherman's face is pea green, but they can also be very, very subjective, a problem in the eye of the beholder. I've worked on many a set and had it looking, to my eye, crystal clear and showroom fresh, only to have the customer tell me that it still doesn't look right. That was the case the afternoon of my story. I was at the house of one of our regular customers, a woman who was known for coming up with the most nebulous and hard to diagnose problems. Many we firmly believe existed only in her head. She still persisted in calling us, and on the day in question I found myself seated behind her big console TV, trying to find out why it didn't look right. A mirror on a stand in front of the set showed me the results of everything I did, and I'd been working on the set for over an hour without being able to successfully make it look right. My knees were hurting, my ego was damaged. I was this customer's favorite, and I was failing her. It was getting late in the day and she was happily sitting in her chair passing judgment on every adjustment. I heard, better, worse, no difference, but never that we were done. It was obvious to me that whatever the mysterious thing that she was waiting to see was never going to materialize. The picture was crisp, clear, balanced, and beautiful. Then in the midst of my preparations for Harry Carey, an idea occurred to me. I was going to let her have some involvement. I still can't believe that I even thought of this, much less that I actually did it. Such was the depth of the despair I was feeling. You see, on the old sets with picture tubes, it was possible to adjust the vertical and horizontal picture synchronization. Without going too deep into the techie part, if your picture's vertical sync got out of adjustment, the picture would appear to roll, like a film strip being pulled across the light. The picture would continue to roll until the vertical hole was adjusted, and the control was sitting right in front of me. I started my rather audacious plan. Ma'am, I've got it very close, but I'm going to need your help to get the perfect picture locked in. I'm going to scan through a series of pictures, and when you see the one that looks right, let me know so I can lock it in for you. The lady was kind of excited. She'd never been asked to help before. She leaned in, and I very slightly adjusted the vertical hold so the picture started to slowly roll. She watched intently for several frames and then suddenly exclaimed, There! Stop! Ooh, can you go back one? With a happy, yes ma'am, I stopped the roll and carefully let it roll backwards once. There, there, that's perfect, she exclaimed. I very carefully locked it in, made sure that everything was in order, and put the back of the set back on. My customer was positively bubbling as she signed my service ticket and saw me to the door. I left the employment of this particular shop a few months later, moving forward in my telecom career. So I never responded to this lady's house again, but the other tech on the bench at the shop later told me that she was satisfied with that set for a long time. I never had the call to try that again, and my coworker admitted that he could never work up the nerve. I still can't believe that I not only did it, but got away with it. And down below in the comments from old gray troll we have, back in about 1977, I took a TV repair course at my local community college. Tubes, pots, learn how to use a high voltage probe. Fun fact, high voltage probes have very sharp tips, 
Second fun fact, high voltage makes your muscles contract uncontrollably. Third fun fact, touch the wrong place on the TV while you're taking high voltage measurements of the picture tube, it'll cause your bicep to spasm and drive the high voltage probe towards your throat at a high velocity. If you're lucky, you scratch your neck instead of plunging the needle tip into your throat. I am very lucky. And just about this time, solid state TVs hit the market big time, and my knowledge became obsolete almost immediately. So I became a computer programmer. When I was a kid, I had a, I don't know, 12 inch black and white, maybe 14 inch black and white TV in my room. You know the one, the one that's missing the UHF channel changing knob and the usually the on and off slash volume knob. Uh, usually it got pulled off and lost somewhere, but as long as I had a pair of needle nose close by, I could make all that work. But in the back of the set exposed, now this was 1980, 80, 81, somewhere in there, the vertical and horizontal holds were accessible outside the TV case. So I don't know what time frame this guy's working on or anything. And mine probably wasn't a tube TV, so I'm not sure, but it was totally there. I mean, he needed a small point. Usually I used a steak knife to adjust mine. And I'm not sure why it went out of adjustment, but every so often I had to mess with it just to get everything just right. Man, I still remember Saturday mornings watching the Three Stooges on that TV, trying to keep the volume as low as possible because I hadn't asked permission to watch TV yet, so I was kind of sneaking. Oh goody, another one for me to butcher. Just hire Zephrim Cochran. That's his co-train, I'm gonna commit Harry Carey. Circa 1980, I was working for a timesharing vendor in the US. Access to our computers was via our own dial-up network. Since most of our customers were in the US and Europe, that's where our computers were. One day I got a call from one of our sales reps screaming that his new customer in Australia was complaining about lousy response time. We had to fix this immediately since this customer was potentially worth thousands of dollars each month. Our monitoring software showed that we were consistently meeting our SLA, service level agreement, of 2.5 seconds, so I asked for details. Often bad response time was due to problems with the local telephone service, especially in rural areas. For all I knew, this customer was at a cattle station in the outback. Nope, the customer was in a brand new office building in Perth, just a few blocks from our access point. Okay, sometimes response times just seem bad, but when you actually measure it, it's within the SLA. Nope, this customer was running a script that issued a set of commands and recorded the response time. His numbers showed it was between 1.5 and 2.25 seconds. So what was he complaining about? And why was he running his own response time monitor? We charged for connect time and usage, so he was paying for what was in effect an extra user that was signed on all day and running this script. Except he wasn't, and he wasn't even complaining. In fact, he was delighted. The salesman was so eager to make the sale that he changed the SLA to guarantee sub-second response time. Since we weren't meeting the SLA, we couldn't bill him. So this customer was using our service for free. The salesman was the one complaining since his commission was based on billing. I sent him an email explaining that the communications link between Australia and the US was via a satellite in a geosynchronous orbit about 22,300 miles above the Earth. Since data travels at the speed of light, which is about 186,000 miles per hour, it took more than half a second just to send the command to us and the response back. That leaves us with less than half a second to process it. In order to meet his SLA, we would have to build a computer center in Australia at a cost of about $1 million a month. We both knew that wasn't going to happen anytime soon. He demanded that I come up with another solution, preferably before the next billing cycle. Every few days, the sales rep called me wanting to know if I had a solution. Finally, I said I had. All we needed to do was figure out a way to send data faster than the speed of light, kind of like warp drive on Star Trek. I was sure there was a few Nobel laureate physicists who would love to come work for us. I suggested he submit his idea using our formal suggestion process. Management had a better idea. They decided we really didn't need a sales rep who signed contracts like that without the approval of the technical and legal staff. As far as I know, this customer used our service for free until PCs came along and commercial timesharing went the way of punched cards and paper tape. Yeah, this is an age old problem. As long as there have been salesmen on this earth, there's usually a customer right behind them with unrealistic expectations. Can't say that word today. Here's a hint, if you're going into sales, and I suck at sales, but let me tell you something, one thing, one thing, if you take nothing else, stop overselling the job. Don't promise them the moon if all we can do is give them a snapshot of it. That's it, simple. User needs a splitter. So along with my regular day-to-day -day computer technician position, I also work in procurement for the IT department of a large organization. Yesterday, I popped into my email and read a computer equipment request form it had several items listed, such as a headset for Zoom meetings, a new mouse, etc. All low-budget items that we have in stock and would normally be approved right away. 
but for the last item on their list, they asked for a splitter. That's it. No other information, just a splitter. So I email them back asking what kind of splitter they require. Are they trying to split audio, video, or something else? Today I got my response, which basically just said, it's been 24 hours, where's my equipment? <sighs> Thanks for not answering my question. I noticed that they're in the same building as me, so I decide to wander on over and ask them directly what exactly they meant by splitter. She tells me that she can't plug all this stuff in at the same time, that there's only one available USB port in the front of her computer. So she's asking for a splitter so that she can plug more than one item in at a time, such as a headset as well as a webcam for Zoom meetings. Ah, so a USB hub is what she wants. But wait a second, what about the USB ports on the back of her computer? Eventually, I get back to my office and approve the equipment request, except for one item. In the area where I explained why the request was denied, I wrote, Today I taught a user that there are USB ports on the back of her computer and not just the front. Three ports available. I mean, it sounds innocent enough. I get it. She only knows of the one USB port, and she knows she's going to have multiple USB items that need to be plugged in. So I get that. And I get her confusion that, you know, most of them, thank God, she's not one of those that keeps pulling her computer out and messing with things on the back that she shouldn't. But at the same time, you sent her a message asking. She could have answered and said, I'm not really sure. I just know I'm going to have a bunch of things to plug in and only one USB hub. Now, the conversation would have been so fast and you could have explained it all, but she chose to ignore it anyway. Fabulous. $500 mainboard DDR4 compatibility. So I recently sold my used Gigabyte Z170X Gaming G1 motherboard on eBay and shipped it to Sweden. The buyer contacted me a few days later that the motherboard was defective. He was not getting a picture through either the onboard GPU or his external GPU. The error message. Error 23 allowed me to narrow it down to a problem with the RAM. In addition to the usual questions about whether the memory is properly seated and he's already reset the CMOS, which he's done everything. I read through the manual of the motherboard. On the product page, I found a compatibility list for the RAM and sent it to him and asked if his memory is listed there. He was using a HyperX Fury 3600 DDR4 memory, which was not listed. He was able to borrow a different stick and boot with it. That was the mistake. This brand of memory is not compatible with a $500 motherboard. Hours wasted on troubleshooting for that. This is just a short story, but I was fascinated that compatibility problems are still around these days. I've been pretty lucky over the years. I've either had motherboards where it really didn't much matter, you know, except for finding out if it's DDR2, 3, or 4. Um, but, you know, most of the time I just get something close and stick it in there and it works. But the motherboard I have now isn't, you know, like exactly high end. And when I expanded it to 32 gig of RAM, I actually just went and looked at what brand was in there that this assembler used and just went with the same exact stuff, same specs and everything. So that way I kind of knew it was going to work, but yeah, it's good to know. The user bubble of alternate reality. Most of my immediate and extended family live within 60 miles of each other, except for one family who lives most of the way across the country. Because of this, it's a pretty big deal when they find the time and money to fly in and visit. A few weeks ago, exactly this happened. And there were plenty of family get togethers as a result. Interestingly, the out-of-town uncle-in-law's family also lives near the rest of us, so a few of those events included many of his relatives that I'm not familiar with. So I'm technically at an event with strangers, but it feels like family, which is what I'm blaming for my guard being down. Me. So what do you do? Stranger. I'm a dermatologist. Me. Interesting. I've heard that's the best income versus emergency field of medicine to be in. Is that true? Do you ever get dermatological emergencies? Stranger laughing. No, you might be right. Unfortunately, you still get plenty of people stopping you, asking for free medical advice. And as a dermatologist, it's never something you want to see, and rarely something you want to talk about. Me. Oh God, that's got to be terrible. I feel your pain. What is it about some professions that make people act so rude? I have stylist friends, and I've never asked for a free haircut. Stranger. I don't know. So what is it that you do? Me. I'm an IT. Technically, I'm a network engineer. Stranger. Oh, so I have this laptop that's been running slow. What do you think is the problem? Me. So the guy, wait, so the guy just got done complaining about somebody asking him stuff, you know, outside of work about whatever their skin issues might be and not getting paid for it and really not wanting to deal with it off the clock just to turn around and throw this in the tech family members lap. I really hope he was joking, but the, the story stops there. So who knows? Maybe he was just being sarcastic. I doubt it though. Well, hey guys, let me know what you thought about the picture and the sound and everything else today. I already know how you feel about the cat, so. And if you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, click this video here so I can get some more of that sweet watch time. All right, guys, see ya.